we've come to one of my personal favorite topics in this series, advocacy. If I might share a little personal info about myself, my areas of focus, or my dream areas of focus, I should say, uh, is in community health promotion and disease prevention, global health, and health policy. What do all these different yet interconnected fields of specialization have in common? It's that they all, in some way, focus on healthcare advocacy for their populations. Now, the medical community in general has a duty to advocate on behalf of their patients. In nursing school, we're taught that one of the foundational pillars of the nursing career is advocating for your patient when they cannot, or to augment their own personal advocacy. We'll be diving into some critical issues in community health and wellness and how public health workers advocate for their patient clientele. However, healthcare workers don't just advocate for their own populations. They advocate, by extension, for other populations as a result of their care towards one sector. As a result, people not directly included in a certain patient population benefit from that community being better served and helped by workers. All right, enough chit chat. I'm Fina, your host, and let's kick it. When I mention the word advocacy, I mean sticking up on a person's behalf or in tandem with them to make sure they understand their rights and get the care they need to remain or become healthy. The AMA, American Medical Association, is a leading organization for the United States physicians of all disciplines. On their website, they list many key issues that require the advocacy of healthcare workers to influence critical care and policy decisions by lawmakers and stakeholders or to rectify issues in their own communities and workplaces at a lateral level. Of course, they are accountable to the public and communities they serve, so they must also be allowed to work in concert at individual levels with certain people who require more personalized care, or particular groups that may require certain types of care given by certain types of people. It's all in an effort to increase equity. The key issue to outline today on the topic of advocacy is one that the AMA seems particularly concerned with and is a major epidemic in the US, the opioid abuse and misuse crisis. Chronic misuse of opioids slash narcotics has been a problem for many, many years, especially in regions of Appalachia, where only around a decade ago, folks from this region were being devastated by cheap and legal access to prescription painkillers in Florida from fraudulent pill mills the colloquial name for pain management clinics that dotted the state. They have since, there have since been efforts to call the pill mills, and they have been mostly successful, though of course some pill mills simply up and moved locations. Since the point stands that the opioid crisis needs advocates to speak out and vie for harm reduction strategies as well as educating and preventing addiction before it can strike by treating underlying social, psychological, and physical issues. Advocating for naloxone distribution to lay people, first aid instructors, law enforcement, first responders, and ex-substance abusers as well as current substance abusers has been a push we've seen in the public health sphere over the last couple of years. Narcan can be bought in stores or given via prescription, although a common complaint that I and many others have is that the cost to purchase Narcan is often a barrier to buying it and should be reduced to be affordable to the general public. With or without insurance. To speak of its importance in broader strokes, we must understand what naloxone is. Naloxone, brand name Narcan, is an opioid antagonist that reverses the effects of an opioid overdose if administered in a certain amount of time. It can be administered nasally via a spray. Now, besides saving lives, it gives ordinary citizens the power to save themselves or their loved ones in case of an accidental or intentional overdose something previously only done by a healthcare worker. This is a very empowering decision and a great public health policy. As all healthcare workers know, a person is not just their illness, and their illness often originates from another source, whether it be trauma, injury, emotional instability, material circumstances such as loss of housing or a job, death of a loved one, their environment, etc. As a final note, I would like to say one thing in regards to naloxone. 
It cannot be abused the same way an opioid like heroin can, as they are antagonists to each other and naloxone has the opposite effect on the body that a chronic opioid user would want. Ergo, they wouldn't abuse it in the same way, and frankly, naloxone comes with its own set of unpleasant side effects, so its abuse potential is very limited. If you would like to learn how to administer naloxone yourself, I've included a video link in the description. In brief, I would like to discuss methadone, a drug used as an MOUD, medication used to treat an opioid use disorder. Methadone has been used as a weaning drug for ages, since the 1950s, I believe, gaining widespread popularity in the late 70s. Methadone is for use in curbing a heavy narcotic user's cravings for opioid by giving them a much safer drug that, while it does have a small abuse potential, it is nothing compared to heroin, morphine, fentanyl, etc. Drug monitoring programs, known as PDMPs, also fall under the umbrella of advocacy as well as drug disposal programs. Generally, an advocate will address oversight and respond with calls for greater accountability and initiate actions to get that accountability. Drug monitoring programs can be instituted outside an inpatient healthcare setting or they can be instituted in a healthcare setting like a hospital. A great example of drug monitoring is the process of wasting a drug. In many healthcare settings that focus on acute care or inpatient slash long-term care, drugs, including narcotics, must be wasted if they are not used up fully. As such, a nurse, um, but I don't know if a CNA or LPN can waste medication, but I do believe they can witness it, is tasked with disposing of the medication and someone else, usually another nurse, will watch the wasting. The first nurse will then document that the wasting took place and the witness will sign off on it. However, medication, especially controlled substances, diversion is a serious problem. As such, public health advocates install programs under which controlled substances must be counted and documented, as well as missing quantities of medication reported. Consequences of taking home a controlled substance or not wasting it properly under supervision can include loss of license, termination of employment, and legal charges. Now, you may be wondering, why don't prescribers just write less prescriptions for opioids if this is such an immense problem? Well, the solution isn't so simple. And guess what? They are writing less, almost half the number they were writing within the past decade. There are people, many people in fact, who have chronic pain conditions and require certain medications to be effective for their pain. Others are involved in debilitating accidents or injuries or even have cancer or at end-of-life care and require a strong analgesic, which is the fancy name for a painkiller, to manage their ADLs, their activities of daily living. The biggest problem by far is this. We do not know the pain of every individual, and pain is subjective. If we simply ignore those who ask for opioids, especially in a hospital setting like the ED, where opioid prescription and use is highly stigmatized, the pain could overwhelm their ability or desire to undergo recovery, like physical therapy. If a physician does not meet their needs and someone is desperate, they might seek illegal methods of acquiring pain relief, which puts them at greater risk of overdose due to, for example, drugs being cut with dangerous substances and a lack of understanding on what a lethal dose is. It's a very tricky tightrope to walk, and creating black markets for substances and alienating users while criminalizing their habits is not at all the solution. Insurance companies also share some of the blame for making non-opioid medications inaccessible to their policyholders, creating a no-choice incentive for any physician and patients. However, in recent years, medications such as meloxicam, gabapentin, Pensed, and more have provided relief in non-opioid form to those suffering from acute or chronic pain. What is the solution, however, is opioid education, which can be done informally or formally by about anybody. A friend can refer a friend struggling with finding a way to use clean needles to a needle and syringe exchange program, where public health workers advocate and produce clean syringes and naloxone, as well as places to dispose of dirty and used needles in order to limit the spread of HIV and hepatitis, two diseases commonly spread through contaminated needles. Of course, this also limits the potential for someone to overdose if a qualified professional is nearby with Sonarcan. 
If someone can do telehealth, a public health worker can educate the user on the use of, and I'm sorry, I don't really know how to say this, but I believe it's buprenorphine to help wean the user off opioids. Finally, I would like to close today's episode with recommendations from the AMA addressed to the 50 states to end the opioid crisis. Quote, Stop prior authorizations for medications to treat opioid use disorder. Prior authorization is a cost control process that health insurance companies and other payers use that requires providers to obtain prior approval from the insurer or payer before performing a service or obtaining a prescription. It is used to deny and delay services including life-saving ones, as physicians are required to fill out burdensome forms and patients are forced to wait for approval. Side note, I've experienced this myself before. <laughs> Ensure access to affordable evidence-based care for patients with pain, including opioid therapy when indicated. While opioid prescriptions have decreased, the AMA is greatly concerned by widespread reports of patients with pain being denied care because of arbitrary restrictions on opioid therapy or a lack of access to affordable non-opioid pain care. Take action to better support harm reduction services such as naloxone and needle and syringe exchange services. These proven harm reduction strategies save lives but are often stigmatized. Improve the data by collecting adequate, standardized data to identify and treat at-risk populations and better understand the issues facing communities. Effective public health interventions require robust data and there are too many gaps to implement widespread interventions that work. And so that's it. We really dug our heels in on this one. I'm so happy to learn more about public health with you all. This has been a really amazing series for me to produce thus far. If you'd like to read a bit more about the opioid crisis and what physicians and public health officials are doing to combat it, please have a look in the description. Well, until next time, Take it easy, everyone.